Hello and welcome to Loose and Tea After Hours. I'm your host as always, Edward Jones, and joining me, of course, is my co-host, Miss Kim Lowe. Hello. Tonight we revisit one of our most favoured traditions here on Movies and Tea, and that is, of course, Shark Week, with a film that can be essentially listed as being the shark movie that started it all. The one that launched a thousand imitators and all of them failing to ever meet the same standard left by this film. We're of course talking about Steven Spielberg's classic film, Jaws, from way back in 78, I want to say? 75. 75. For those of you who may not be aware of what Jaws is, I don't know, I don't question your film taste. Jaws is based on the Peter Benchley best-selling book of the same name in which the quiet vacation town of Amity Island finds itself under siege when a ginormous man-eating shark moves into the local area and starts preying on the locals, leading small-town Sheriff Brody um, to step up to deal with the shark problem while the mayor is busy trying to cover up the issue because of the impending... tourist season while local fisherman Quint sees it as a chance for redemption to quash some old ghosts. So Kim with Jaws was this like the first shark movie you saw or was this like somewhere down the long line of shark movies that you've seen over the years? <laughs> well I've already said what, what my first shark movie was. My first shark movie was Deep Blue Sea. Of course yes. Yeah, so that was like way in the beginning. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I watched Jaws in recent years. I think it was maybe uh, a few years ago. Um, I actually realized I never reviewed the movie. I actually reviewed it on another podcast, um, had a discussion piece over there, and then I never actually did the write-up for it, but I have the write-up for the, all the sequels, so I don't know. Maybe it's time to make up for some lost time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly with Jaws, it's not only a, a creature feature or a shark movie, whichever category you just prefer to sort of lump it in. I mean, this is a movie which launched, essentially, the summer blockbuster, and this was completely by accident. As originally, it was set for a Christmas release, but the delays in film production saw it being put into the summer season and back in 75 the summer season was seen as like you know the dumping ground for all the bad movies because you know they assumed people wanted to be outside and not like cooped up in cinemas and Jaws essentially comes along and changes all this and Spielberg leads in many ways this sort of like charge of the new Hollywood so people like Lucas, Scorsese uh, like coming in and they just completely change what the summer blockbuster movie is um and it all starts with a movie featuring a giant plastic shark of all things um but for myself i mean jaws is um a movie that still sticks with me um it's the reason i'm not particularly fond of swimming in the ocean which is a real kicker when you live in cornwall which is surrounded on three sides by ocean and all there is to do in the summer is to go to the beach (laughs) So there's something about when you look at Amity Island that just like really resonated with my sort of psyche. It's sort of like Amity Island is very similar to the sort of small coastal towns I was like growing up and spending all my time in. So it was just like this perfect storm of like childhood scarring um, horror that uh, all came together in this just this movie, which is I think as close to perfect as you can get. Not to like give the game away, but I think. By now, I think you all have your opinions on uh, on Jaws, and it's now probably why we put it off for so long. Uh, but now we're obviously talking about, you know, the big one that uh, that is Jaws. So, yeah, I mean, Jaws is definitely overdue over here for sure. I mean, we we, but it's it's such it's such an obvious choice to start with that sometimes I feel like you we could you know right now we're at the bottom of the barrel (laughs) so we kind of have no actual choice but to eventually have to embrace this um so i i don't know i mean jaws is 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 a is a it's hard to argue that it's a bad movie i don't know how many people out there are arguing that it's a bad movie (laughs) my wife wasn't impressed (laughs) she still doesn't understand why a giant plastic shark is scary so, I showed it to her. It's like, oh, you know, this is like this fantastic movie. There's all this great dialogue and 
character stuff and she's like it's just a giant plastic shark this isn't scary this is stupid and I was like they just went off and sulked and it's like no it's not <laughs> well I mean it, it's it's you know to use our own right yeah. but I mean Jaws is, is not just a creature feature and and in many ways it's it's so much more than that because it has that kind of adventure type of feeling and it was these kind of like different type of parallels that you see in different movies that are trying to be something like this right and there's that sense of adventure with with the whole boat and the soundtrack which i believe we saw in when we were looking at deep rising and then there's that sense of like tension that that's there as well in the surface and then some movies go like all tension and not so much other things and we you know over the past few seasons that we've looked at shark movies it's 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 hard to say obviously what makes you know is this a creature feature is this an adventure film is this um is this a horror you know like what what do you categorize this in but i think that that's the best part about it is is that you can't really categorize it in one thing it's so many different elements that work and then you put it together and and i mean arguably like you know steven spielberg has a super long filmography (laughs) so and amongst all the great things he's did he's done over the years there you know there are a few standouts and jaws is definitely one of those where he really had everything in place and you know or as as you know you always say that there's a lot of things that didn't work but it all worked to his favor basically <laughs> it seems to be a very spielberg thing they even went for things that would like normally kill movies seem to always work in spielberg's favor um certainly was the case in in this film i mean they're shooting the film over in Martha's Vineyard, which is over in Massachusetts. It's uh, basically a stand-in for Long Island. And basically it's known... The area as well is it's pretty shallow. I mean, it only drops to around 35 feet. Um, so you can uh they had some real sort of issues with like trying to work around the fact that, you know, there's land in the distance because Spielberg never wanted to like give the option especially during the second half of the film where we were going hunting the shark that you know they had this option of going back to land he wanted to like constantly give us the illusion that they're in the middle of the ocean even though uh they weren't (laughs) (laughs) um the film itself is like plagued with horrible technical issues i mean this is all practical effects which is why it's got such presence but they're filming 12 hours a day but only four hours of the day would actually be through filming because normally something would be breaking the shark would sink it would break um they would the boat at one point started sinking so there's just constant issues throughout the film and somehow Spielberg manages to like pull it all together in the way that probably only he can to create this sort of like memorable film and as you said already it doesn't just fall into one category it's not just a horror film or a creature feature it's also a film about people uh in particular this small town of amity where there's so many different in- aspects at play which makes it such an interesting location i mean not only do you have um chief sherry Brody, who's moved in from the from the big city to the to his uh wife's sort of like hometown you know, seeking for like this quiet town to raise their kids. Uh, within the town, you've got uh, the mayor Murray, who's busy doing what he can to keep the tourist season open because Amity sort of like lives and dies in its tourist season. So, the fact that Brody's there is churning up the waters like the shark and saying, you know, we've got a shark here, we've got to close the beaches, and he's like, no, we can't close the beaches because this is where all the money comes from, and when you go deeper into it there's also like all these mafia under dealings that are mentioned more in the book um and you also have characters such as quint who's like this local fisherman who at the same time has been raging his own sort of war on the on the town and sort of uh using this as his sort of like hideaway when he came out of the navy and has spent the best part of uh his life destroying sharks essentially he leads uh takes people out on shark expeditions and hunt sharks and it's all about him dealing with this trauma that he suffered while he was on the USS uh, Indianapolis who um, which was a boat which was sunk and its crew came under attack from sharks and he's now 
the way dealing with these demons by basically destroying these creatures which terrorized him um and he's sort of like the first person to set up and say and like ideally the best person to like deal with this giant shark issue but um of course uh the town want nothing to do it they just want to try and push it away push it away and the sharks just keep the shark just keeps coming back keeps preying on the uh on the locals and it just all these different elements sort of like come together and the fact that it's been able to change the genre constantly just why this film i think stands out so much more than the imitators which just basically focused on oh we'll just get a bunch of like shark attacks you know that that will give us the same thing they just focus on the scares rather than the humanity that this film has yeah I mean, the the characters itself are are really interesting to watch. I mean, especially since I really love how um, Captain Brody... Uh, the, is it Brody? Yeah. As a captain? As a He's captain? police chief, but it's all the police same. police chief, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Chief Brody, that's it. That's his name. I keep, I keep mixing it up. So Chief Brody, I really enjoy that... He's this person who just moves into town, so everybody treats him like he doesn't know anything. Um, that he's kind of over judging the situation or being over anxious over all these things. And at the same time, <laughs> I like his kind of attitude because <laughs> I love how he's scared of water, but he's on an island. <laughs> and then that whole conversation about like how that's the case. And he's like, well, it's only an island if you look at it from the water. You know? <laughs> and then, and then, you know, you have this whole thing where <laughs> him and his wife, his wife actually shows up quite a bit and they have kind of like these comedic little moments where they start seeing things. Like she starts seeing that picture of the shark biting the boat. And then originally she was okay with the kids being sitting in the boat. And then suddenly she was like a whole flip. <laughs> um, there's like these little comedic moments and and their relationship like their their relationship as a couple is also pretty fun to watch as well it kind of adds a little something much like you know when they bring in um richard dreyfus's character uh playing the uh oceanographer um hooper yep. and he adds a lot of because he he everybody kind of like dismisses him because he's kind of young and he, he seems like such a rookie and no one really takes him seriously. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> he's he really knows the stuff and he's kind of like the gear and he's kind of like the direction of where, of what they're looking for, basically. He knows what size the shark is going to be. He knows what, like, he's able to finally pin down what what is really important here but at the same time he also doesn't want to deal with all the bs that's going on in this town as they start you know the authorities are trying to ignore all this yeah definitely so i mean when it comes to hooper he's as, as he says himself he's uh spent many years inside sharks um his whole thing is that he's this guy who's come from a very privileged upbringing and he's used it to sort of further his own his family's wealth to feather his, his research into sharks so the fact that there's this big almost should we say like prehistoric shark roaming the waters it's like oh as much as a boy who had thrilled him to like hunt this mythical shark as it is to obviously be involved in this investigation to find out uh, what exactly is going on here and the fact that he's like one of the few allies that Brody has in this town because everyone else is pretty much against him um the local fish fishermen when they're given the you know the when the ransom goes out to hunt the shark they're all just basically a bunch of yahoos as we see in that great scene where they're all like traveling out and you've got the guy from dynamite in in the air uh, water and stuff they're there's more focused on like um on just the idea of capturing this this shark rather than you know trying to go at any sort of logical way and i think with hooper he basically brings in the logic into the hunt um and he also gives someone a great counter really when we get introduced to quint um who's obviously quint's out there to destroy sharks hooper's out there to save sharks and you've got these meeting of different ideologies in this head-on sort of collision and the fact that they're both such fierce sort of personalities neither one of them would back down and Yet somehow over the course of this hunt, they managed to find this common ground as we find them drinking to each other's scars that they've suffered from the ocean um, and their various misadventures. While Brody like looks on and you see him like finger the gun wound from his uh, 
which basically retired him from New York and moved him out to Amity. So it's um, every single character in this film like plays their part. I mean, like from Brody's wife, even like the kids have the the sort of play in it. They're not just there to get into stupid situations. Like we had that super charming scene where uh, Brody's youngest son's copying his dad's movement to the table, and it it's just bringing this humanity to the film, which we don't see in creature features normally. They're just more focused on creating big set pieces and shocks and, uh, you know, creating a sense of a sense of place. And I think this is what Spielberg brings essentially to the table. He's a director who focuses on people um, and places rather than just event pictures like, you know, something like Michael Bay does. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, th there's no doubt, you know, that St Steven Spielberg is is a lot of, you know, he is the director, so <laughs> he gets a lot of credit for for how this movie is pieced together. Um, but I, I, you know, like, and I think that that's the main <coughs> thing is what what makes us so successful is is that is is that you know it, it's a lot of things that creature features aren't, and that's why I think it's it's hard to call this a creature feature. Because for a creature feature, the shark doesn't really show up that often. <laughs> it's more about like the, you know, how this town is dealing with this whole situation. And I think that's where the forte is. Obviously, you know, the last scene is a lot about hunting the shark and, and how powerful it is. Like it can drag down barrels of those floating, flotation barrel yeah. type of things. And... It, it, it shows it, it in these little moments you get to see a lot of just how like the how big this threat is um, without actually seeing it and I think that that's one of the really great moments because you know obviously it's, it's a plastic shark there's nothing <laughs> really it's not it's like when the shark shows up you don't really feel like he's going to be that much of a threat um, and I think that you know, a lot of it is in the tension of it, just, you know, like a creature underwater from their perspective looking at you, you know, and it's, a, you know, and, and it creates that tension because you, you don't really see the object of what's going on. Um, and, and that's a really, obviously, that's like a really strong point I personally like when it comes to like horror movies. And this is where the horror really works in, in sense of Jaws. Yeah, there's certainly. I, do, I mean, did you ever read the Peter Benchley book? No, it's I awful. <laughs> so I just told you that <laughs> it's more. It's basically the book is more uh, focused on the town and the sharks. This background threat. Um, I mean, Brody's wife goes off with Hooper at one point. There's a whole affair sequence which is cut from this film, thankfully, and it's well. Obviously, Peter Benchley came on to do to work on the script as well. The fact that. Spielberg went his own direction with the with the screenplay. I think it only works to the film's advantage. Um, much less, they got a much better. They they got that now iconic poster of like the shark coming up and the girl swimming, which was uh, on. It's a reworking of the original cover of the book, but the shark looked like a giant sperm um, <laughs> rather than a shark. It's really quite unfortunate, but. And you can't actually do those sorts of posters anymore. You can't show women in peril on posters. Mm. Which is an interesting piece of censorship. But yeah, it's... it. The, with this, this this film again, I mean, it's... I just kind of keep going back to it. I mean, you know, this is just like... It feels like such a place. And I mean, you mentioned already, I mean, the fact we don't see the shark really until... A good, oh, I don't know, a good hour into the film, should we say, give or take. Mm. Um, which it, imagine like saying to like modern audiences, it's all like, oh, we got this monster, but you're not going to see it for an hour. I just wonder if there's any sort of directors that would be able to to pull off what uh, happened here. And a lot of this, again, it's just due to the fact the shark was hardly working. Um, Spielberg was like often referred to as the great white turd. Um, he named the shark Bruce after his lawyer. Um, <laughs> so there's and there's scenes as well where they were recut because they were just like 
he was uh, very unhappy with they were they were sort of looking and I think all these little things just really sort of added to the film so that when we get the big uh, scene of like the shark popping up when uh, Brody's there shoveling the chum and he does that iconic oh I need a bigger boat <laughs> line it does this has so much impact to sort of like you think you have an idea what you're going after and then you see the size of this shark's head come up and you're like oh <laughs> this is we're, we're perhaps a little unprepared for this um, so I love I love that, and even though we do get like a couple of shots, like when it goes into the pond, we get that wonderful long shot of the shark, where uh, you got the hippie chick who sees it going into the pond and starts like shouting "shark." <laughs> I love those uh, those shot those those shots, and even the one where it's coming up under the guy um, underneath when they're in in the pond sequence. I think those ones are great, but it's just even though we get these little glimpses, just that shark shot of it coming up. Uh, behind uh, behind Brody is just it just has such payoff to it. Um, but with the act, I mean, we've talked a lot about the town and the characters, but with these actual sort of shark attack sequences, I mean, what did you sort of like make of them? Because there's a lot of all, like teasing the audience here. I mean, we get that iconic opening shot: the skinny dipper being attacked by the shark at the beginning, and it's all. Lots of thrashing around and stuff that we're not seeing. A <laughs> dorsal fin, we don't see nothing, but and still, it manages to be like this really intense little sequence. And then we have that wonderful thing, which we can really only do in water horror, where after the shark's over, we get just the perfect calmness of the ocean again. It's just, it's yeah. just so eerie that that calmness. We have this moment of violence and then just perfect calm. Um, I always found that like super effective. So, what is your sort of feelings? I mean, do you have any particular sort of favorites when it comes to the attack sequences, or or uh, where do you sort of sit with them? I don't know. I never, you know, I you know it's a weird thing, but Jaws is, I think, the most famous attack sequence is the opening yeah. scene. And then everything else feels very normal because at this point we know there's a shark. So nothing feels particularly like um, effective or great. I mean, even when you're talking about the boy who gets eaten on his float <laughs> and, um, or, or, you know, even, even at the end when, uh, when Quint has his, you know, brush up with yeah. him and, that sort of thing. And and it, you never really feel like... You know, it's, when I think about it, I don't really remember <laughs> a lot of shark attacks. And I think that that's one, of the, that's one of the main things of this movie is that... That's why I, I sometimes don't really consider it a sh creature feature other than the fact that its central piece is, you know, a shark. <laughs> but um, if it was for me, I would definitely say that the first the opening scene is probably what really delivers when if you're talking about a shark attack and it's exactly for what you were saying like the calm that they show afterwards you know you have that whole like pushing her down and she's just like crazily yelling and <laughs> and you have this contrast of this drunk guy that's just lying there and he doesn't <laughs> he's completely oblivious of what's going on and he wakes up and then you know <laughs> and then she's not there anymore type of thing don't even know what happens to him type of thing <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's so key as well to the rest of the the plot. I mean, obviously Brody wants to write it up as a sh a shark attack when they say the remains. The Murs then got his sort of like corrupt uh, medical professional there to like write it off as a boat. Um, that she's been hit by a, a boat propeller, and he's like basically says to it, it's sort of like you know we write this off as a boat accident, and you know we're fine. But you say shark, and that's gonna really trigger people. And the the we also get that like iconic shot of her remains on the beach, um, which mm -hmm. is actually a, a female member of the crew that they buried in the sand because uh, Spielberg Spielberg was unhappy with the fake arm they had, so he just buried a crew <laughs> member in the sand and had a lie that was being covered with crabs, and which I guess is uh, why it looks so realistic. I guess. <laughs> Must have been thrilled to do that part. <laughs> it's like my big break. <laughs> I'm Chrissy's arm and jaws. Yeah, the the kid on the lilo um, was actually a much more bloodier sequence when they originally shot it. Because um, the kid who who plays him, Jeffrey Voorhees, he was a local kid, and basically they hired him and they hired all his his friends uh, to come and play swimmers and 
and stuff on the beach but they were on they could never get like the shot because it was originally going to like show the shark really sort of chomping down on him and you there is some really blurry footage of this sort of sequence there but they were they could just really went sort of happy with the way it sort of looked and i think the way it's shot instead where we get that zoom in on Brody's face that like where his like worst fear is now being realized um while at the same time you get to see uh, the kid being dragged under, we get a little glimpse of the shark. I think it's just uh, it, it's a scene only made all the more uh, spectacular by the fact we get that huge plume of blood like come up, which is what I remembered like yeah. from the first time I watched this movie. I didn't really remember remember the girl being attacked to the front, but I sure as well remembered that that kid on the lilo biting it. The kid who actually played him, uh, as I said, Jeffrey Voorhees, he would actually open a seafood restaurant. Um, and on the menu, they had an Alex Kinter sandwich. Now, the actress who plays her, his mother, Lee Ferreira, walked into the restaurant and like commented the fact that she played the mother in the film uh, when she saw that they had an Alex Kinter sandwich. And he like came out of the back and he was sort of like, I was Alex Kinter. I, you played your son in this movie. Um, and the fact they hadn't seen each other for like years since the shooting, it was just a beautiful reunion over a sandwich. So... <laughs> the the prop shark itself uh, is actually hung up in a seafood restaurant at the moment. The one that they used to the Disneyland ride. Okay. Yeah, when it when they shut it down to put like know, Harry Potter or something in there, um, the actual shark from the ride is now hanging in a seafood restaurant somewhere. Now, with the score, it's obviously got the John Williams iconic score. Spielberg originally thought it was a joke, and they didn't, they wouldn't work, and then. Uh, <laughs> When he when they put it onto film and saw how audiences reacted, uh, he had to apologise to Williams and say he was wrong. Well, Williams got a great jump start to his career because he was obviously going to like do Star Wars and like so many mother mother many like iconic themes that uh, you wouldn't think that again a little shark movie would be the movie that not only launched the summer blockbuster but also gave Joe Williams his his uh, big break. So. But yeah, no, I mean, the, the score is definitely iconic. There's there's nothing like, you know, two notes gives this, <laughs> gives, you know, you never, you never really consider this to be this, how simplistic it is to create the tension that it is, obviously. I mean, the score is obviously much more than yeah. that. There, and it, and it, and it runs pretty, and it, and it like blends really into the film itself. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I really, I, I always think that it's such a, it, it's just so iconic that people don't really like. Even if you haven't seen the movie, <laughs> you would have heard it. Yeah, it, and you would still know. It's what still it part is. of the like pop culture lexicon. It's like you know when you say Stepford Wives, or, and you hear that music, and you just know something ominous is creeping up on you. And the fact that it's like the heartbeat uh, in that the plays in the background in Alien, or it just uh, has this sort of presence to it. It's sort of like. Is giving the shark presence on the screen, even when we're we're just in like shark POV mode, um, when we're sort of like moving through the, for the ocean, and we just know that the more intense the music is getting, the closer the shark's getting, and it's just, it uh, it's one of those just an iconic piece of music. It's like the Halloween score. It just sticks with you, and you. I mean, even just like doing a, if you just like hummed a couple of notes, you're like, bah, bah, bah. Uh, well, and then people like instantly know it's like oh that's the Jaws movie <laughs> <laughs> so I would I love I still love the the score to this one and certainly when you get into the many of the scenes in the film just like how complex the score is how it like perfectly matches certain moments such as like when Brody's there like, like drunk and defeated I mean and he's just there like drinking at his uh, table or when we're hunting the shark and it goes into that almost like a venture sort of like rift yeah. um, when they're pursuing the shark and we forget oh we're not in a horror movie we're now in an adventure movie we're on this we're like one of these three guys and this like adventure to go and hunt the big shark so and I think it's the the willingness to change genres on the fly like that is why this film sort of stands out more than many of the imitators did I mean there are not to say there's not been films that have come close or even matched it, um, but because it's just, as, and this is the point we keep returning to, it's just it's so much more than just one thing. Um, I think that's why 
that that's why it's so effective and certainly with the score it only if ever emphasizes these moments as well along with just like some really fantastic performances throughout yeah and and you know you know th- you make a really good point because when we when we look at blockbusters nowadays a lot of them are fairly one tone in the sense that you either you know maybe you have like two genres together yeah. or something uh, like you know horror thrillers or whatever or action you know action comedy or whatever I don't know um, just off the top of my head <laughs> but those aren't like blockbuster themes I guess <laughs> or like dramedies or something like that right but when you look at you know and then and then you look at movies nowadays as to why there's there's not as many films that kind of reach that same caliber as Jaws um, using creatures in general and I think that that that's one of the main main contributions I mean is, is the fact that you know you can change genres uh, constantly and I think um, this kind of leads me to why I really enjoy the liberty that indie films have nowadays because indie films you see a lot more of these really mixed genres combined together um obviously you know creature features <laughs> low budget isn't really in the <laughs> in the horizon so you don't really see a lot of creature features in kind of like limited budget but um but i mean i think that's a that's a very very good point in the sense that why blockbusters now don't quite have the same type of appeal especially when it comes to making you know kind of like a predator and prey you know type of type of uh, type of film like that yeah um now until we see the final sort of hunt here where we got you know one quince boat the orca um and we're following like Brody and hooper and the fact that I mean, Brody obviously has no experience on boats. He gets he's seen there with like uh, the rag there because he's getting seasick, and the fact that him, Hooper and Quint are both boat people, so they got all the they know how to like tie a sheep shank, and they know what they're doing on boat and boats. And Brody's basically re- lost any idea of, sort of uh, standing because I mean he's still used to having some level of respect because he's the police chief. And here on the boat, he's like basically the bottom pe- bottom rung of this ladder. Um, the fact he's also dealing with Clash the Clash, and he goes to Quint, who's basically well, it's his boat. He's going to do everything his own way. And then you got Hooper, is like trying to do things like the scientific way. Um, and then you've got uh, obviously Brody, who's caught in the middle of this uh, this clash of clash of egos and. Somehow, over the course of the film, the three managed to find this sort of common ground to them before it all falls apart <laughs> rather rapidly. Uh, with Quint essentially going full Ahab, he gets uh, sees his opportunity to capture this big shark and is uh, just can, becomes completely zoned in on this uh, this idea of of uh, dragging this uh, shark into the shallows and drowning it. And uh, at the same time, we've also got. Hooper is basically uh, trying to do what trying to do what they can to uh, you know uh, use what resources they have to try and uh, stop the shark. And we have the moment where he goes in the uh, the shark cage and then goes and hides behind a sand dune because he's real hero material like that. Um, <laughs> in the original book, he actually gets uh, eaten by the shark when he goes in the cage. Um, but uh, with the this trio of characters i mean how did you find this uh clashing of ideologies uh that uh, really sort of makes up the final part of this this film it's certainly not the direction you would expect a creature feature to go but um especially because it takes moments to slow down the pace and um take times to really sort of get to know these characters about all the other interesting things happening in the town like the karate kids karateing the fences and um, these other sort of minor characters that provide all the local colour. By putting Monty Orca, we're essentially just stripping it all away just to these three characters. But I think that's because these three characters are so core, right? They have so much power in their characters themselves. They each are authorities kind of in their own field. Um, so you kind of have a power struggle at the same time as having 
um, them being able to talk a little bit more about themselves and giving, especially, you know, when we come to Quint, who who talks about, you know, the USS Indianapolis and what happens to him there and what essentially leads him to doing this. Because from the beginning, we just think he's some, you know, crazy fisherman <laughs> who who is very, very cocky and really believes that, you know, he's the, he's the only person that's going to be able to bag this shark. And he's going to charge you a hefty fee <laughs> just to do it. And, and you never really see a lot of what he's capable of doing. And the same goes for Hooper, but where, you know, he has his own expertise and he's able to do, you know, the whole, the whole uh, autopsy element of it and really understand, like, the theory behind it more than the actual, I guess, the actual thing. Uh, but you have these two points that kind of meet together and then you have this Brody who who is essentially shoved into this situation <laughs> where he's he's scared of drowning, he hates boats, he hates water. Um, all these things, you know, the three characters kind of represent different parts of of stance on, on these things. And that's what makes it interesting when they finally, you know, at one point when they're drinking, they, they finally unite and despite the uniting, obviously, <laughs> they still have their differences when things go haywire. Right? But, <laughs> but you know, it's a, uh, it's 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 interesting to see how these characters are developed because I think that the you know the last scene really gives a lot of space for Quint's character to grow, um, you know, and and it it's in all in due time, obviously, because he. He really, it kind of explains a lot of his, like, crazy attitude towards this and how he's re really hooked up on, you know, fighting the shark. Yeah, of course. I mean, with, with Quint, I mean, he's basically the, he's a hired gun, essentially. Um, yeah, at the same time, he drops his services. Well, no, sorry, he, he, he takes advantage of the situation, the fact that the town have done basically just made the situation worse with the shark. Because originally he offers to kill the shark for 3000 By the time the town comes crawling back to him, he's upped his price to 10000 So he knows very much that he's the the guy who's, who's going to get the job done. And there's a lot of smaller details when you certainly look at his uh, character in the book. I mean, the fact that he's had numerous run-ins with the mayor's office because of... Uh, where his sort of fishing shack is built um and the fact that he basically uses all this like knowledge he gets from books to fight the town so he's a constant thorn in the side that they can't get rid of him uh but at the same time he's got nowhere else to really go i mean his whole business is just doing shark tours and making moonshine and this is how basically how he subsidizes his, uh his his living um, then when it came to obviously cast him, I mean obviously Robert Shaw is cast here with Dustin Knight, a truly iconic performance. Um, at the same time, it's uh, been said that it's only been said by Roy Sch Schneider who said that um, working with Robert Shaw because he was uh, an alcoholic, he was like working with Jekyll and Hyde. That when he wasn't drinking, he was a perfect gentleman, but when he had a drink in him, he was a mean son of a bitch. Um, and the scene where he's like supposed to do the Indianapolis um, speech, he was supposed to originally do it intoxicated, but all the shots they tried the terms to try to do it when he was uh, drinking it, they just couldn't get it done. And basically, Shaw like came back to him, he was like really upset over his performance, and he said to Spielberg, "Let me do it sober," and he did it completely um, right the first time. And he did it in one take, and it's uh, now this iconic monologue of just this man basically giving us an insight into where into what makes him tick basically this idea that you know he was once this like Brody and Hooper is this uh idol this this person who's just obviously been corrupted by this this horrific event that happened to him when he was sort of based to spend all these hours in the water waiting to be rescued while uh, sharks were basically feed, trying to attack him and the crew of his ship it's, this is something when I see Robert Shaw's character we see his character in this film is just I can't really see anyone else doing the role as well 
um, as he did. I mean, they obviously talked to Lee Marvin, who said that he'd prefer to fish for real than to, to be a play a fisherman in the film. They also consist of casting a local fisherman called Craig Kinsbury, who um, actually had a role. He turns up as um, as uh, Ben Garner, who's uh, probably best known for giving us the best jump scare of the movie that still bloody gets me every time. When his decapitated <laughs> head pees peekaboo. I don't, I've seen this movie so many times, and every bloody time that head gets me. I just, I feel my head is like, oh, it's coming now. And it's like, nope. <laughs> as, soon as, I get, <laughs> as soon as I've like misjudged it, it then appears. Um, and that is probably one of the most tweaked scenes of the film. Spielberg said that, you know, when he was, when they were originally uh, showed test, test screenings for the film, they had like the big reaction to the shark coming out of the water and then he was like oh I'm sure I could get another jump here and then he did the pe- the head and he kept tweaking it to like maximise the effect and he was like judging on how high the popcorn was flying each time he showed it to people so but I mean this is just Spielberg isn't it it's just a maestro at work just constantly tweaking details that no other filmmakers probably wouldn't think about just to work a small jump scare into something truly memorable so but the final sort of showdown with the shark, uh, which basically down, comes down to Brody um, on a rapidly sinking boat. I mean, how did you do you find like this idea of the shark that's just like slowly destroying a boat, um, and how it like just just how the whole sort of attack sequence plays out? These the big finale. How did that uh, sit with yourself, Kim? I think it was pretty good. I mean, it, it's because, you know, whenever we have these big moments in, in, in creature features, it's always kind of represents the same type of thing. And and this this is probably the part where we're most in that creature feature zone because the shark at this point is relentless. He, you know, when they're doing all the, sing, all the singing and everything and they're finally united, it starts crashing through yeah. the boat, which makes the boat leak, essentially. And then, and then at one point, you know, you, you basically, it's 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 it, it it's just kind of the boat is just breaking apart at, the, at this point. The shark cage goes, and things fall apart, <laughs> <laughs> and it all kind of like comes together really quickly. Where as the boat is sinking, the shark is starting to attack into the boat now, um, where they're kind of taking refuge. And I really, I I think it's I think it's 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 nice because you. It's a really fun scene because now, you know, the danger is is there. Um, the actual shark is there and he's just coming for you. And you can see how they're, how, you know, like they're fighting against it. And at the same time, in the back of your mind, you're kind of thinking about, oh, well, when is, <laughs> when is Hooper going to show up? <laughs> because, you know, he, you know, he survived. He's in the back of there somewhere. He's hiding underwater somewhere. But when is he going to pop up, you know? <laughs> And and he essentially doesn't because until the very end, <laughs> and it, it all of a sudden it ends up that Brody, the man who is deathly scared of water, is suddenly thrust into this position where he has to figure out how to, how to fight the shark, and and it's and it's really and it's really fun because you know he he uses all the resources he can, and, and then he's just trying to 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 blow him up basically. Well, yeah, I mean, the fact he gets blown up by an exploding air lung's really sort of like a... Uh, it's kind of a little coincidental, <laughs> it has to be said. Um, yes. In the original book, the shark just... I'd say the shark dies of old age, but um, it's supposed to, like, die from its wounds because we have this scene where, like, the shark's coming up on, on the boat and Brody's there, like, staring it down and then it, like, just keels over and dies. <laughs> so it's it's a little it's a little weird when you read it, and it's a passage I had to like go back and read a couple of times. It's like to make sense. It's all like the shark just died. Okay, um, <laughs> very exciting. It, it is. It, it's <laughs> it's, it's sort of like he's, <laughs> he just stirs that shark down, and it just keeled over in pure fright. Uh, but Peter Benchley hated the ending that Spielberg gave the movie, and I'm thinking, well, your ending wasn't much better. So. And I like the, it's funny. Like there's little bits of the film, like when they're going along the side of the boat, and you see like uh, his his deck shoe slip on the side of the boat. That fills me with such yeah. tension when I see it. 
It's like, oh, he's going to fall in the water, or the shark's going to leap up or something. But it it's when it's like the shark's like, the boat's like going fully under underwater, and it's like busting through the side. And, you know, the last place Brody wants to be is in the water, and he's just like desperately trying to like do what he can to stay the water. And then when he's up on the, uh, the rigging and it slowly starts sinking as the shark's holding in on him. Um, as he's just like stares it down, it's like one final stand. It's just oh, fantastic filmmaking. Um, and my dad said that when he he saw the the uh, Jaws when it was in the cinema, and said that when the shark blew up, everyone in the audience cheered. And uh, when I <laughs> years later, I would, we would go to see uh, Independence Day, and when they blow up the big ship in at the end of Independence Day, the same thing happened. The audience cheered. And I was like, oh, we finally had our Jaws moment. <laughs> Although, I mean, I'm guessing a lot of people would have a really long discussion with you <laughs> if you're comparing Jaws and I'm talking about just like the climactic thing. I mean, it's this big moment where we beat it down with the string. We finally defeat it. Um, yeah. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it's just the uh, the this big explosion <laughs> that everyone just went to cheer. I would say when I saw the raid and you see like the two on one fight. Um, at the finale of that movie, people actually cheered at the end of that one as well. It's all, and I was like, just like looking around, going, Pff. "When you've seen a fight of that skill, it's all you can do is just cheer the screen." I guess. Well, I mean that I I feel like raid is a completely different experience as well because it is like one man going through an entire yeah. building, right? So you have everything against him, and then at the end when he finally. When he finally makes it, you can't help but to feel a little like, you know, <laughs> he went through some stuff. <laughs> like it kind of deserves it. <laughs> it's just it's just fun that like that as the audience when you have when the summit and the audience has like that shared reaction to something. Um, we don't really get it now in in modern cinema. I don't think people in audiences are just well, so distracted, or we're just not getting those sort of same sort of payoffs. I really, I really feel like it's just like, you know, modern cinema and like the general cinema is like that. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about, you know, being on location for film festivals, which is obviously something that hasn't happened. (laughs) I mean, I don't know when this comes, when this episode goes out, probably by the pandemic will be mostly behind us at this point. But uh, but I mean, like for the for the last two years of film festivals, basically it's all been virtual. So you kind of miss out on that effect because I think that's what it is for film festivals is that it's it's particularly fun because you have everyone reacting at the same time to this, you know, world premiere movie that no one else has ever seen or some some movie that's finally hitting the festival circuit around you and you get to see it with a bunch of other people who are fans of movies because those are the only people who are seeking out film festivals Uh, and and it's doubly nice because at the same time you know the a lot of times there's the producers or the directors or the actors or something there and and they get to kind of join in with you because it's such a some of these are just such early pieces that you they haven't even seen the final cuts of it so they're kind of cheering along (laughs) at the same time and and it's such a really great moment when when you have that and and i think that i mean i've never experienced this in theaters myself like i don't go to old movies reruns in theaters or anything um and i rarely go to the theater in general so my theater visits are mostly for blockbuster movies that I really want to see. And then they usually turn out into, depending where you go, um, it's usually annoying people in the corner or people playing on their phones yeah. or, you know, <laughs> or like couples kissing in the corner, or, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And, it, and, it, and it's not, you know, like, it's one of the, you know, the, every time you go to the theater, it's kind of like, it turns you off a little bit more. So. It's where you could discover the 10 a.m. showing. It's like when when I was like, you know, it used to be the midnight showing was like, you know, the cool showing to go to. But now a 10 a.m. showing, there's no one in. You can get a coffee. It's it's just brilliant. Other than oh man, I don't know. I think I did one 10 a.m. Yeah. showing once for Lord of the Rings: Return of the King, and. And I fell asleep. I'm about to say, if I go normal time, it's <laughs> it was sort of like nine. Nap. It was like a nine a.m. showing or something, and then I fell asleep for like ten minutes or something. 
<laughs> I took a power nap and I woke up and I was like, okay, we're ready. I can continue this. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, you know, the, they have showings of this where, like on lakes where like, you get to sit in an inner tube. I can't think of okay. anything worse than watching Jaws in an inner tube. <laughs> um, oh my god, that would just like that'd be that'd be traumatizing for myself. Whew. But then I don't tend to like go to like a lot of like you know when they have like uh, old movies come back in the cinema, unless I've seen yeah. if I've seen it before. I don't tend to like go. It's so weird watching like a movie like Jaws or Apocalypse Now in the cinema, and you're just like like. Instead of like your yeah, film, you're so familiar with seeing at home, and then to see it on a big screen, it's such a weird experience. And also, the seats normally suck in the places doing them, so it's like sitting on a wooden board for four hours if you're watching Apocalypse Now. <laughs> uh, I took my friend to see Apocalypse Now Redux, and it was like four hours, and it was all like they had an intermission halfway through. And you're like, so relief you get to come off your wooden board and then the dread that you've got another two hours when it comes back on still to sit through, so. Is this bring a cushion? I you? should have brought a cushion. I should have. <laughs> Instead of focusing on smuggling cheese boards in there to piss off the art house crowd. Um, <laughs> yeah, my game of what's the weirdest snack I can smuggle into the cinema. <laughs> but those cinemas are great when you want to, when to go by yourself because you don't have to, like... If you like go to like a nice cinema, you're gonna like it's got too much sense of occasion. But if you find like a nice grimy cinema, you don't mind going by yourself. That was the theory back in the day. Now people just go to the cinema because they just can't be bothered to find people to go with, unless they're like trying to hook up or something, I guess. But anyway, so in like the big Jaws of like the shark movie. Pamphlon. Where do you sort of rank Jaws? Is it like your favorite shark movie, or is there other shark movies you rank above it? No, I I think Jaws is really great. Like it's hard to deny the location of like how good it is. Um, I mean, I don't go back to rewatch Jaws as much as other people, <laughs> probably because I don't own the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Move to the UK; um, it's always on TV. So. Yeah, well, I also don't have uh, oh, yes. a TV with channels. My TV is just for streaming and casting at this point. Because, um, you know, I'm too cheap. To, <laughs> You're just too hip. You just do what, to, to, to get cable. Just one of the hip kids um, now, Kim. That's what they all do. They don't own TVs. They just stream everything. So. Well, it, it's great because, you know, Jaws is on Amazon Prime at the time that we're recording this. So, you know, we were able to watch it on that. Um but, at, I mean, Jaws is pretty high up, I would say, in my ranking. Um, I would probably still, I think from <laughs> this whole creature feature season, we have a really good idea about where I stand on horror, on creature yeah. features. Um, <laughs> is that I like kind of something with a little bit of fun to it. Um, Jaws does meet that. I would say, like, it would be pretty close to the top like uh my top movie is obviously deep blue sea for both sentimental and just fun yep. reasons <laughs> i really like it um much like you know deep rising had that kind of same effect and if you think about it some of these films kind of have that tight the kind of like brushes against that feeling that jaws has it's just jaws is much more refined as a movie um, but, you know, obviously because it's Steven Spielberg and you, you have all these different genres and all the things that we talked about in this pa in this past, like, hour or so. <laughs> um, so, no, it'd be pretty high up there. It'd be, like, top five, you know, when you talk about, like, shark movies. Yeah. Um, How about you? I know I know you're a big fan of this. <laughs> Jaws like, 2 is... trumps the first oh, one. It's... So... <laughs> on, a, on certain days, I would say Jaws 2 is better than Jaws 1. Controversial opinion, I know. But um, Jaws 2 is a discussion for another day because I, I do really love Jaws 2. Um, the Jaws 2 had the uh, really iconic poster of... the You get to see the sea at sunset and you've got the shark fin and it's like just at the on the top it says, you know just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. And there's another one which has got like two sharks on which really misled because you thought you were going to have Jaws 2. Jaws 2 is going to be like two sharks now but it wasn't. Just one mean ass shark. Um, I think when, when it came to Jaws 2, Jaws 2 is much more of a sort of traditional creature feature. I think 
the closest we got to this film was Orca from 1977 with Richard Harris and Charlotte Rampling and I believe Bo Derrick's in there as well um, about the fisherman who's uh, stalked by a vengeful killer whale after he, he um, kills its pregnant mate and I think that was the closest we got to to matching what we got with Jaws I mean Jaws itself let's not forget it would go and spawn three sequels as well as Bruno Matai's <clears throat> unofficial part five cruel jaws because uh Bruno Matai is the master of the unofficial sequel and let's not forget I mean it obviously led on to numerous other shark movies I mean you had the Italian ones such as like uh Mako Jaws of Death and uh, The Last Shark we got a whole host of uh other creature features from like Grizzly and Alligator um, as we obviously covered on our creature feature season, the right, which also included like the wonderfully bonkers Italian uh, creature feature Wild Beasts, as directors constantly throughout the seventies tried to one up each other to see what the uh, animals they could make the scariest. And right into the nineties, early two thousand, we obviously Deep Blue Sea. Deep Blue Sea was a real return to form, and Lake Placid, I think, also needs to be noted as well um, as really sort of capturing the capturing that ride and then it's just been downhill ever since <laughs> because the um, asylum had just been churning him out once a week for god knows how many years now so you can go off and watch was it six Sharknado movies now I don't know you watch, <laughs> I watch up to I think three yeah, and then I stopped you can watch so. Sharktopus and five headed shark attack and all that nonsense so but um, Jaws will forever remain the the film which uh, sort of sparked a fascination with like creature features, with sharks, um, and sure it misses out some of the the details of the book, but at the same time it's capturing this believable sense of a community, of a place uh, that Amity just felt so real. And at the end, no matter like you know, handling of the situation, I mean, it still begs the question, really, is it safe to go back in the water? Just myself, still a classic. No matter how many times I watch it, it's still fantastic. So that brings us to the end of tonight's episode. Thank you, as always, for listening. If you haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to be leaving to us, listening to us, and leave us a review, as it all helps raise the profile of the show. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You can also check out our blog, which is Moves and Podcast at WordPress.com for our full archive of episodes, as well as other fun pieces of writing, including our Friday Film Club, where every Friday, myself and Kim both pick a film to highlight. Sometimes it's a theme, sometimes it's not, but either way, it's a chance to just talk about more of the films we love. Um, but what have we got next, Kim, as we continue our After Hours season? Yeah, well, next time we're going to be talking about your pick, uh, which is 99's Virus. And I don't know why I'm talking about it, because, you know, I know nothing about it. So <laughs> Yep, we're talking about Virus from the greatest movie year ever in a film that Jamie Lee Curtis absolutely hates as a uh, group of uh, salvage uh, engineers stumble across an abandoned Russian battleship. But... An alien entity has taken control of the ship. Make sure you check us uh, that out next week as we check out Virus. Is it uh, as bad as Jim Lee Curses thinks, or is it a lost gem? We will certainly find out next week when Kim watches it for the first time. So make sure you join us uh, for that. But until then, thank you as always for listening. Thank you to my co-host Kim, and we'll be back next time to talk about Virus. Until then, good night. Mm-hmm.